Uh, you heard in the open there, we dug that one back out from earlier in the week, uh, Delegate Mike Hornby, our owner of this uh, radio and TV station, we were talking about immunizations and religious exemptions for immunizations. And I guess, uh, what, about two weeks ago was the anniversary of the first Salk vaccine for polio. Now, polio, in my lifetime here in America, is nothing that I'm familiar with. Um, I know overseas, it is still a problem in some areas of the world. Uh, Bill, when you were a kid, you probably saw some aspects of it. Absolutely terrifying. Absolutely. I, I'm from a small town, uh, and and there would be a rumor going out, so-and-so child had polio. It would be a panic. We, The kids would be locked in a house. We could not go out, uh, play with the other kids. We could not go swimming. We couldn't do anything. And it was, it was random uh, who would get polio, who would not get it. Uh, it was absolutely terrifying. And I think the initially, Bonnie was telling me last night, was reminding me that the initial uh, vaccine was sugar cubes. And we would take the sugar cubes, and just the possibility, just the availability, gave us a phenomenal sense of relief. Uh, unless you've lived through something like that, when you you cannot see the enemy, but you know the enemy is at the house next door or the down the street of someone that just got polio. I don't think you can fully appreciate how disturbing it is yeah you're right i can't appreciate yeah. it because it was not an issue after i was born in 63 and at that point you were just jabbed and you kind of moved on as uh, you know, without any fear of it so this prompted a discussion that we had during the course of the aftermath of that discussion that they were having in charleston as to whether they could provide religious exemptions for those types of vaccinations and uh delegate mike height uh, who was in favor of providing the exemption made the statement that well who cares if you have the polio vaccine you can't get it what difference does it make if someone else doesn't want to get the vaccine and they get it once you're <coughs> vaccinated you can't get it so that brought forth the uh the quest for more information is that true and so I asked Teresa McCabe to set us up with somebody from the hospital who might know more about this. And that's where De Dr. David Baltiera comes in and joins us via telephone this morning. Doctor, thanks so much for being with us today. You're on with Rob and Bill. Well, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. So the premise is that once you have your polio vaccine, your, your MMR vaccines, that uh, you are effectively immune from those diseases for life. This is what we operate under, those of us who are vaccinated, uh, first and foremost. Is that still true, Dr. Baltier? Once you've been uh, immunized for those diseases, you're set for life. It's not completely true. Our vaccines are really great coverage and really do a great job of, um, you know, protecting people. But Vaccines vary. So, for example, the tetanus vaccine is almost 100 percent effective. On the opposite end, the flu vaccine is, you know, 40 to 70 percent effective. So we all rely on um, a community of immunity. That's what really protects our children. Um, you have to reach a certain threshold of vaccination, um, and often that's an 80 to 95 percent. Um, of people to have it to eradicate these diseases and protect every child. Um, even if you're protected, for example, the measles vaccine is, let's say, 90% effective approximately. So, you know, there's going to be 10% that have wanted to protect themselves that can't. Plus, we have um, children with certain medical conditions that can't get these vaccines. Not a choice. Um, you know, and I, I kind of um, disagree with um, the view of religious exemptions, they're really personal exemptions. Most of the religions, um, you know, and having grown up as a strict Catholic and, you know, being very religious, that was not part of the religion. It's, it's a personal exemption and, and um, distrust of the vaccine system, which we need to work with people on. But no, we need to develop a community um, of immunity to provide the herd immunity and reaching levels of 90, 95% immunization to, to really protect everybody, even people that are vaccinated. So the premise then that so long as you have your polio or MMR vaccine, you're fine. You can't get infected even if everybody else in the class has contracted polio or MMR because they didn't get the vaccine. I'm being oversimplifying. I'm oversimplifying this. Yeah, so you, that's that's yeah, a faulty so premise. If you have it, you, you can still get these diseases. The chances are low. But um, and once these diseases are in the community, we've seen that lately with, you know, outbreaks you know, um, of measles in certain communities in the United States. Um, 
in our own community in Jefferson County, we had a pertussis outbreak related to a small group of people that were not protected, and we had to re-immunize all healthcare workers in our system and, and many, many, many other children. And, you know, there's not only a healthcare cost, there's a significant cost of redoing that because a small percentage of people did not get vaccinated. And I, I've probably had, you know, I'm, I'm the same generation as you, mm-hmm. um, and I've probably had six to ten, uh, probably ten pertussis vaccines, and I had to be re-immunized. I grew up, my dad was in the Air Force, so we traveled a lot. So I actually, I don't know if anybody's seen the, the World Health Organization vaccine books. It's just basically a vaccine log. I have three of those. So um, I think, you know, the safety is very clear on this. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, doctor. Uh, there's a lot to unpack with this, and uh, unfortunately it's become an emotional issue uh, with many, It's uh, and they... Uh, it's a religious issue, uh, uh, political issue. So there's a lot of things involved. Uh, to simple it first, let's let's look at polio. Yeah. Uh, polio was one that uh, we came close to eradicating worldwide, but there were a few pockets of it uh, st- that had, that still existed. It's my understanding those pockets are uh, are re- are spreading now. Is it possible? And again, I'm going to come back to COVID in a couple of minutes. But is it possible that we're going to have to go through the same polio protocol tomorrow that we went through yesterday because we did not fully I, eradicate it? I mean, anything's possible. I don't think so. Okay. The, the danger is more, you know, the United States, West Virginia is a great example. Um, we, we have the only exemptions for vaccines for our children, which is where, you know, the major events will happen and the recurrence is you know, medical exemptions, true medical exemptions. So the packets that exist are in um, war-torn areas like Afghanistan where, you know, this has been disrupted. It's been used as a political tool. Um, And so if we keep our children immunized and worldwide, we do as well, then I think we can control it. But, yes, it's it's always a possibility. So worldwide, um, the vaccination rate for polio is um, almost 80%. Um, and, if, and it sounds like, you know, you've been to Africa, different places mm-hmm. I have. Um, those families would love to get their kids vaccines. It's being prevented for other reasons. Um, and initially it was, it was all financial. I mean, we're, we live in a, a rich country. We're fortunate. And our children can and should be immunized. Yeah, I was using my question from uh, basically as a stepping stone. My next question, is it a uh, is it a good analogy or pure analogy to compare covid and polio um in terms of what in terms of what in terms as of far the resurgence as are coming up as far as treatment and the uh, uh and the availability of vaccinations of vaccines yeah um i think in terms of diseases and the science of it they're very different but in terms of how something can spread and be all over the world it's it's definitely a possibility if we look at what covid you know the what has been accomplished with COVID in terms of the vaccine community. It's pretty amazing. It took decades to come up with the fuller salt vaccine and then the inactivated polio vaccine. You know, that happened throughout my lifetime. And I have seen polio cases, um, or what, not polio, but post-polio cases, people that were affected, um, you know, as children with polio who then would develop pneumonia and because of that, had a higher risk of dying from respiratory failure. Um, I actually trained in Cleveland where we actually had um, a regional polio center, um, and we used um, iron lungs. We don't need that anymore. Those are all gone. But that's the, the, um, the legacy of polio. And there are still some people that are at risk for post-polio sy- syndrome um, as we age. But we've, we've, in the United States, eradicated that. Um, COVID, on the other hand, you know, is much more of an acute, more akin to the flu. But we don't know what the long-term COVID effects. I, I saw patients yesterday that we that are having mental fog, dizziness, other issues with that are probably related to their COVID infection six to 12 months ago. Um, and so it's much, you know, it's different in the sense of the long-term consequences in terms of the vaccination. There's clearly um, similar aspects to that. Yeah, you mentioned iron lung. Uh, the a lady in my hometown, Tennessee, lived with an iron lung for something like 60 years. Uh, 
and which is a horribly long time to live with an iron lung. There was a power failure, and her uh, carekeepers were not there, so she died because of a power failure. So it's a it's a bad. She story. died of polio. She well, she she was in the iron lung because of polio, and then the power failure. Right. After sixty years, she died. Uh, the uh, uh, the with COVID again, there was so much controversy associated with it. Uh, in the absence of 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 the controversy. Uh, could we have treated COVID in a way that we would have reached herd immunity and we would have had, we would have had parallel or similar results to the, what we had with polio? Um, in the best of worlds. I, yeah. yeah, that's a tough one to know because the vaccines came so quickly and the disease was developing. We're really talking a thir- three-year period versus a 30-year period to, to even get to the point where we're getting to now. Um, you know, the polio vaccine's been around since the 50s and so it's really been a long decades long fight so no i i don't think it would have been akin to that just because of the you know the acuity of the disease but if you look at when we started at the hospital we were having people you know death rates that were incredibly high and we've knocked that out through a combination of herd immunity and um vaccination rates but we have not really re- uh, reached the level of herd immunity, have we? No, the U.S. probably, there's estimates that 80 to 90 percent of the people have been exposed or vaccinated. So it's hard to say. It's real early. I mean, I think people forget that science does take time. Um, you know, we've gone, you know, when we started this, there was no way to track this. I remember middle of March 2020, we didn't even know what we were dealing with. It had just been identified in December the virus and by you know that summer we had vaccines you know starting and by literally one year after it was discovered we had a, a, a incredibly successful vaccines in the united states yeah um so. but do we make a mistake though of grouping all of COVID under the same umbrella when in fact there's so many different strains of COVID? so you have vaccination that would do one strain but the uh the uh, virus mutates so you need a different different vaccination yeah so that is that's a, a good point because viruses do do that with COVID, fortunately they target um the spike protein and that has been m- effective against all the strains, but not equally effective. So flu flu mutates in a different way, um, and COVID has mutated as well. So even though you may not get as good of protection, um, it still provides protection. And people also need to remember our goal, it's nice not to get COVID, but it's even better if you don't die of COVID. But vaccines are really targeted first to prevent death and then to prevent severe disability and in the COVID vaccines clearly been able to do that even with um, the mutations and the, the interesting and good part is with these RNA vaccines they're able to pivot I mean again within another year once they found out the new variants in September and August we had a new vaccine for those variants to boost people um, available and so it really requires a public health system to contract those variants which we we've underfunded um, and so I think our vaccine community can pivot quite well and and that's shown that the biggest problem we've had with uh, COVID vaccines is skepticism in the public um, West Virginia was doing an incredible job launching this and we were leading the nation there were national reports of you know what our state did to get people vaccinated and then it ground to a halt because of hesitancy i want to bring a comment to the forefront stacy burkett made on our facebook comment section dr voltier is talking about vaccine distrust and hesitancy and she says uh it started with the mmr vaccine and the falsified autism study there were pockets of people who did not vaccinate in the 90s and early 2000s as a result Then she says uh, she knows one family that was involved in the pertussis outbreak. Their children also contracted measles. Would you agree with that summary of when vaccine distrust kind of started to kick into overdrive? I I agree. That's when we've been seeing it bigger and we saw the measles. But there's a whole history in the United States of vaccine hesitancy. You know, we're a country of of, um, counterculture. We're independents. We like that. And so... 
Um, it, it's been going on since the beginning of vaccines, but it definitely has gotten stronger and larger as communities that have resisted that vaccine, particularly the MMR. And as she pointed out correctly, not only was that, you know, unreasonable fear, it was based on a fraud that was committed by uh, somebody who published that and had to be retracted, which is an unfortunate thing for the science community. Dr. David Baltier, our guest here from WVU Medicine. You mentioned post-polio syndrome. I want to bring this back to where we began this discussion because there's also some confusion as to uh, the basis of this conversation we're having with you, and that is whether or not this was based on legislators who didn't want their children to get COVID vaccines or whether this actually was about uh, the bigger childhood vaccinations that you get. And really, this that's what this is centered over, because there was a contingent of legislators, uh, noisy, not large enough to get something passed, but they made enough noise that they got attention that they wanted to have a possible exemption for their ch- for children for all vaccines, not not just the COVID vaccine for kids, mm-hmm. but, but polio, measles, mumps, rubella, the whole uh, line down uh, with uh, what you get before they let you in the public schools these days. So let's go back to post-polio syndrome. What is that? I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, so um, when you get polio, it attacks the, the nervous system and people get weakness, just keeping it simple in that sense. They, if you recover from that, you may seem to be completely back to recovering. Some people you may have seen you have to use walkers or other things, so they haven't obviously recovered. But even in people that recover apparently completely, some of their muscles may still be weak, particularly the diaphragm, which is the muscle under our chest that helps us breathe. When they get sick, for example, with pneumonia in their 60s, 70s, or 80s, they don't have the, the ability to breathe and recover as well. So their 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 muscles are weak, particularly their breathing muscles, and so that's when we can see post polio syndrome. And I've actually seen that in Jefferson County um, within the last ten years. Doctor, coming back, if I can, Rob, uh, going back to mutations for a minute. In the early days of COVID, uh, we we felt like we were chasing a a. Um, uh, a cloud that kept running away from us. We were would get vaccination to treat one mutation, then would treat another mutation with a different vaccination. That seems to have uh, slowed down. We no longer be doing that. Is the is it the reason that we have a more universal vaccination uh, or vaccine now, or is it the fact they're not mutating in as a larger degree as what they were originally? It's, it's a great question, and I, I can't give you a straight answer. I can tell you that we've actually only had two rounds of mutated vaccines, the first one and the second one, and they're working well against the spike protein. But since the emergency disappeared, we're not tracking it as well. Um, I think everybody remembers, you know, there were, you know, dashboards and numbers twice a day at least, and I was in meetings, you know, multiple times a week. Um, when this all started, and we had a lot, a lot of information, and that's come down. And when you have that much information and sharing it with the public, there can be the perception that things, you know, are constantly changing, and, and they were. But um, it's it's hard to say at this point. You know, we'll have to wait and see um, how this, you know, kind of plays out. Whether we'll have a new vaccine in the fall again, um, whether you know there's still those mutations. It continues to mutate, but. As the disease slows down, it mutates less. When it's being spread quickly, it'll mutate more. Um, And so, yeah, so I, I can't give you a very good answer on that one. You made a very interesting point a while ago that in the case of COVID, uh, that the vaccine, uh, vaccine, vaccines were designed to prevent death more so than just designed to contract the, uh, uh, the COVID, the disease. Is that true also with flu? I don't, I don't have that impression with flu, but is it different philosophy? No, it's, it's, it's the same thing, same actually. Thing. The flu even more so, because the flu is not, I mean, I still recommend people strongly get the flu vaccine, but it's one of our less effective vaccines. Um, you know, most of our vaccines that have really, that we require for children, and flu is not required for children, COVID is not required for children to enter school. Um, and we, we do allow parents to make that decision for those vaccines. But the other vaccines are in the, you know, 80 to 90 percent effectiveness. The flu vaccine is in the, you know, 40 to 70 percent on the best years. 
you know, so it's, it's really designed to prevent death um, much more. And, you know, and we see that we were lucky, you know, in the years that we had COVID flu almost disappeared, but it came raging back this winter with really, you know, RSV, flu and COVID. And fortunately, our healthcare systems were able to accommodate that. But if that had been RSV, flu and COVID in 2020, it would have been devastating. Um, fortunately, you know, we are getting a vaccine for RSV probably for newborns and we do have a flu vaccine and so you know our hospitals would have been i don't think we could have handled a a triple epidemic like that at the beginning of covid dr baltier before we let you go i want to bring one more thing to your attention with some concerns about covid and vaccines and we've had in the news over the last six months numerous examples of celebrities people we know of uh and uh I, i know a couple of people that i know personally uh or used to uh, died suddenly, cardiac arrest, uh, generally speaking, relatively healthy people, fairly young, 50s, 60, uh, certainly not what you would consider uh, elderly. And there are two different thoughts on this one. One is that uh, this is a complication down the line from COVID, or another is that the vaccine is actually causing blood clots and cardiac uh, myocardia and cardiac arrest and killing people. So do we have any research on this? I know it's still very young in the process. Mm -hmm. What do we know about this, if anything? Cause and effect. I think we need to continue to look at that. We do have a strong program of, you know, people are harmed vaccines because, you know, anything is possible. We need to continue that, but there is no clear, no evidence that that is related to the vaccine. Um, You know, there's, things may be causally related which means they happen at the same time or after each other but we really need to dig deeper to see if that's related but at present we really do not have any evidence um, scientifically that that's a connection is this is uh inflammation part of long-term covid uh, in regards to cardiac Um, we don't know we do know that covid can affect um the heart muscle we know it affects the blood vessels and can cause blood clots Um, So it it may be, Um, you know, we also, our immune system is what defends us, but it's also what can cause some of the complications. And so, you know, getting a vaccine is, you know, a way of priming your immune system, but doing it in a way that you don't suffer the consequences. So I think we need to continue to study it, but um, it could be related to long COVID. It could be related to other things that, you know, people, what other things are they doing in their lives? Do they have underlying family history of heart disease? Is there some type of medication or drug use that they've been doing? Um, There are so many factors I need to continue to study that. Dr. Baltier, thank you so much for your time this morning. Very much appreciated. You're welcome. It's a pleasure spending time with you.